Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing series of stories about Pensacola, North America's first place city, where in, our, in the course of our series we've been talking about chapters of great events that took place here and also today we want to talk about one of the men who made great history here in Pensacola and that man of course was General Andrew Jackson. Jackson was a, a North Carolinian by birth. He was born in North, in North Carolina in, 16, in 1767 and very quickly uh, through his uh, contacts with the Revolutionary War became a military man. He uh, became a, a, a attorney general in his own state after studying law briefly. He moved to Tennessee in the late part of the uh, 18th century and became, uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, the adjutant general of that area. He became a member of Congress in 1796, a member of the Senate in 1797, and then was the judge of the, a judge of the Superior Court in Tennessee a little bit later on. Uh, from that point on, he became very much involved in military affairs, putting together a, a volunteer force, which he would be uh, calling to, to service many times. Uh, in the first instance, of course, it involved Pensacola, uh, General Jackson moved a force here in 1814 to attempt to, to halt a p uh, planned invasion of the South by the British in that war. And of course, Mr. Jackson was successful. He, he warded them off here at Pensacola and then marched on to, uh, to New Orleans, where the famed Battle of New Orleans was fought in 1815. For the next few years, Mr. Jackson's political star began its rise. And of course, uh, in, the, in 1817, he was called to action once again as he came to, uh, to Florida first of all, to put an end to a slave trading event that was taking place just a little bit to the east of Pensacola. And then as a part of that same venture, he marched here with his uh, small army, about 3,000 men, and literally captured the city because in Jackson's opinion and that of some of his, his, uh, his adjutants, the Spanish here had been aiding and abetting the, uh, the slave trade and Mr. Jackson wanted to put a stop to that. Well, of course, that little event actually triggered uh, the final settlement between the United States and Spain in which Spain ultimately uh, ceded Florida, all of Florida, to the United States. Now, the, at that point in time, the, the ne it was necessary to arrange a transfer of power. And, of course, the, uh, the Congress and the, uh, the cabinet of uh, President Monroe wanted someone who had some idea of what Florida was all about. And basically, the only man they could turn to, it seemed, was Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jackson did not particularly want to come, but ultimately he did. And consequently, he moved here uh, with his force, uh, a, a, man, a, a group of about two companies of uh, infantry and a small band, along with Rachel. And they arrived here in the, uh, in the month of July, early July in the year 1821. Uh, Jackson moved in. The, the intent was, of course, that a, a series of ceremonies would take place. He was to meet, first of all, with the Governor Cayaba, the outgoing Spanish governor, and they would set together a kind of a plan, a protocol, for the change of flags. Uh, Cayaba, of course, did not uh, get along well with Mr. Jackson. He didn't like him, even though he had never actually met the man. And it took several days before the two men finally reached an accord, and the, a, a date was set, and that was to be the 17th of July. And from that point forward, the ceremonies proceeded. Jackson came into the community with his, uh, with his infantry, and with his wife. Uh, the ceremonies were conducted in uh, uh, Plaza Ferdinand VII uh, beginning about 10 o'clock on that uh, seven, uh, 17th day. And as a result of that, things began now to move forward. And what Jackson did for us next was basically this. He first of all set in motion our city council. He brought with him the first city charter, which of course had been approved by the Congress. It had eight different ordinances to it. And this established the fact that the, uh, there were 10 men selected from the existing leadership of this community, men that most of the people here knew. And as Jackson spoke that day before, of about 700 people gathered in the square, he, he listed these men and said that they were going to serve uh, until next, the following April. And after that, the eligible voters of the community, all white men over age 21, would uh, uh, elect successors to the uh, to the aldermen, or if they liked them uh, liked what they had been doing, they would be kept. And of course, all of this was a, a kind of a total surprise to the community because virtually none of these people had ever been uh, able to cast a ballot for anything. So that was the beginning of what Mr. Jackson did for us on that day. Secondly. 
He set up what would what we would today call the basis of our county government, and he told the uh, the entire group there that day that all of Florida, the entire area, all the way to the Keys, was being divided in half, and that these would the the halves would represent two counties. A Scambia County would run from the river on the west all the way to the Sewanee River, and uh, the uh, the second county, St. John's, would go then from the Sewanee down to the Keys. And then he laid out the the duties of the of the commissioners. He said that these three men are going to be in charge. Of of building and maintaining all of the roads, bridges, and ferries. Now, if we look at that piece of real estate today, we recognize, my gracious, that one must have been a terrible, uh, a terrible assignment, a terrible burden to these men, particularly recognizing how difficult transportation was. But actually, to begin with, it wasn't much of a job because there were no roads, bridges, and ferries, and these three men had to begin from scratch. And for the next, uh, next basically, the next half century, the construction of roads, uh, the uh, the building of a few ferries, uh, the efforts to get transportation back and forth, they would be major efforts that would take on, be taken on by men who, of course, were successors to Mr. Jackson. Okay, the third thing Mr. Jackson did was to tell the, the audience that day that all of Florida was going to be, uh, uh, be in the hands of an assembly. This was a legislative assembly of 13 men, and the first 13 had been chosen by the Congress. They, they came from all across the territory, and they were going to meet uh, once every year, and they were going to alternate the meetings between Pensacola and St. Augustine. They were to come together the, for the first time on April the 1st in 1822. And of course, uh, there were a couple of these people who were coming from Pensacola, a couple of others from St. Augustine, and the others were sort of scattered about. And as it turned out, the first meeting was a disaster because the people just, they just couldn't get here. Uh, one of them was killed. Uh, two others were very, very late. It was almost June before the, the meeting was convened. And about the only major thing that came out of that first session of our General Assembly for the territory was that they agreed that Pensacola and St. And Augustine were not appropriate places to meet. And so they authorized a kind of a unique idea. They set up a little team that would march, one of, two, actually two teams, one of which would march east coming out of Pensacola. The other would march from St. Augustine going west. And basically where these two met was a, 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 con, a point of convenience. And that's what they did. And uh, ultimately, they, they met, basically the idea was that they, they came together. Uh, and the, the site was basically where we have uh, Tallahassee today. And consequently, that's where, why we have Tallahassee as our state uh, capital. And uh, within two years, uh, the building of capital buildings and others were underway there. Okay, Mr. Jackson thus had put together uh, the uh, city council, he put together the county commission, and he had announced how the uh, state assembly was going to work. And now the next thing that Mr. Jackson did was to try and establish uh, a, fair <coughs> excuse me, a fair settlement for all of the land claims that had come forth as uh, the uh, transfer of flags between the United States and Spain uh, moved forward. There were hundreds and hundreds of different claims because uh, over, the, over time, the Spanish land grew grants and various sales of man, one family or one man to another had just multiplied. And of course, as the, uh, as the announcement of the, uh, the change of flags came along, many people, uh, particularly those who held property here of Spanish origin, they were concerned. They, they, they felt they wanted to get out. They, they, they just weren't sure what was going to happen. And consequently, uh, the United States put forth an edict that all such, uh, land, all such transactions to be legal had to have ceased in the, uh, in the month of December of 1818. And so so to take care of all of the various arguments that were going to come from that, Mr. Jackson appointed what he called land commissioners. These were basically judges working in panels of three, and these men, men began their work shortly after Mr. Jackson uh, came here as the governor, and uh, as a result of that, they began their work, but they, they they discovered that three men could not possibly handle this, and as a result, a series of commissions would follow year after year, <clears throat> with the last of the settlements being made as late as 1849. Next, Mr. Jackson, we think, did something that was rather unique. Uh, we don't, we're not sure of this, but we think this is what he did. He literally got on his horse and made a, a, a round of a, a route around uh, the inner area of Pensacola and established what we today have, or almost what we have today as our boundaries. We think Mr. Jackson did that, and consequently that was one of the additional items that we credit him for. And uh, interestingly, uh, those boundaries remained almost exactly as they were laid out then, well into the 
20th century. So we give Mr. Jackson credit for that. Now going beyond this, of course, Jackson had to take care of all the administrative details that uh, came from beginning a new government uh, and taking over details and uh, facts and, uh, and records from an old government. And he and Governor Cuyaba did not always get along too well on this. There were, there were several cases where there were disputes, uh, one in, involving a lady named Villar who claimed that the, the Spanish government had defrauded her. They had owed her money on a transaction and the governor, the outgoing governor, would not even speak to her. So Mrs. Villar came to, uh, to Andrew Jackson and pleaded with him to take action. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Jackson, of course, was a, a very court, courteous man. And so he asked uh, Governor Cuyaba to, to look into this and get, uh, bring, this, bring satisfaction to the lady. And Cuyaba sort of stonewalled him, uh, walled him. And so Jackson gave him a second request, which was not answered. And on the third request, he said, well, Mr. Cuyaga, if you do not get those papers in my hand by tomorrow afternoon, I am sending a corporal and guard to, to your headquarters, and we're going to arrest you and place you in your own calabozo. Well, that, that did get Mr. Cuyaba's attention, and he, the records were dug out of the, uh, the old carton uh, that was about ready to go on a ship, brought to Mr. Jackson and uh, to the governor's uh, very, to, well, I guess we could use the word chagrin. He discovered that the, actually the facts were, were, were reversed because instead of, uh, of, uh, Mrs., of the governor, Spanish government owing uh, Mrs. Villar money, it was the other way around. She owed them a considerable sum, and that finally was taken care of, but the case remained one of, of considerable interest. Going beyond that, Mr. Jackson now settled down to put all of the various elements in place. He, uh, he set up his headquarters in the old government house, which was right down on the waterfront. He set up uh, an arrangement so that he began to hear people and, and listen to what they wanted to have as far as uh, the government in their new community. And he also was trying to fill the key jobs that were uh, to be part of the new operation of Florida. And of course, he had come, he had agreed to come to Florida on the urging of his wife, because Rachel had said, look, uh, Andrew, a great many of your men, your volunteers, had followed you into battle on several occasions. They had never been paid. Uh, many of them, some of them had lost their lives, or they had they neglected their farms and their families. If you take the job of governor now, there are going to be good jobs here, and consequently, you can, you can uh, oh, do a little bit of payback, if you will. And so that was one of Andrew's thoughts. Well, as it turned out, things didn't work that way. Yes, there, there were those jobs, but every time Jackson nominated someone from Tennessee, it just so happened that President Monroe had a favor, a favorite man from uh, from the state of Virginia, and Mr. Monroe uh, could trump Mr. Jackson, and so after a short time, Andrew recognized that this wasn't going to work at all. So at the end of about 90 days, Mr. Jackson said, "Well, I, I just I've done all that I could. I, I did what the uh, what the Congress asked me to set up in uh, in Florida. I've done this, and so uh, Rachel, I." I think it is time for us to go home. And so he announced that they would depart uh, about the end of the second week in October of uh, that same year, 1821. Well, the community, which had welcomed Mr. Jackson with some reservations, they, they just weren't sure what to think of this man who had been a, an invader here in Florida on three separate occasions. But by the time 90 days had passed, the people of Pensacola loved him because he had brought uh, order out of chaos. He had brought good things to the people here, and the govern government that had been set up was something that was pleasing to mo virtually all of these people. So at, as, a, as a going away party, the, the citizens here organized a, a big uh, shindig in uh, Garnier's Tavern, and the, just about the whole population turned out. They had a wonderful celebration, and everyone patting Jackson on the back and think, thanking him for what he had done. And so on, on the given day, then he and Rachel aborted their carriage and were on the way, going on their way back to Tennessee, where, of course, he would uh, begin the, the long march to the presidency, and in 1828, of course, he would become our seventh president. Today we recognize Mr. Jackson and in one way in particular because there's a handsome bust of him in, in the Plaza Ferdinand VII looking to the uh, away from the from the waterfront. That uh, that bust by the way we, we, we must not forget that that was a place there about 25 years ago through the good offices of a man named uh, Pete Alcott who at that time was the marketing director for for Gulf Power Company. Pete was loved was a Jackson fan and he was the man responsible for this. So now we have the story of Mr. Jackson. Our first governor, our first territorial governor, a man of great distinction. Unfortunately, he would never return after that final departure.